If you've studied capacitors before, you've probably come across these three equations which define the total energy in a capacitor in terms of the charge Q, voltage V, and capacitance C. What you might not know, however, is where this energy is actually stored, or what it even is. You might assume that the energy just lies in the capacitor plates, as that's where the charge builds up. But this doesn't actually make any sense because if we give two conductors the same amount of charge, then change their shape, the energy stored in the system would be completely different. It turns out that this energy is not stored in the plates at all. Instead, it lies in the space between them, in the electric field. It's this nuance that might not seem that important to you at first, but actually provides us with a much deeper, real understanding of how electrical energy exists not only in capacitors, but all of nature. In this video, we're going to unpack all of this. First of all, we're going to go through the most basic principle of electrical energy, which is that it's just charges moving through voltages. From this, we'll then rebuild our capacitor energy equations and create some visuals to understand why they are what they are. After this, we'll figure out how to express the energy of a capacitor in terms of the electric field, and once we do that, you'll see why all static electrical energy exists like this in nature. By the end, you won't just know where the energy is stored in a capacitor, but see why it couldn't be anywhere else. So let's start with something that sounds obvious, but is fundamental to everything we're going to speak about. That is, the only way energy ever enters or leaves a capacitor is by moving charge through a voltage. This is the key to all discussions about electrical energy, and we'll now use it to understand our capacitor. Let's consider our capacitor in a basic series circuit, and look closely at what happens when we charge or discharge it. After attaching it to a battery, charge is being moved through a voltage onto the plates. When the battery is being discharged, the charge moves back through a voltage from one plate to another. But what is the voltage the charge moves through? After all, as we discussed in the last video, the charge in the plates and the voltage across them vary during the charging and discharging processes. So instead, let's think about each little increment of charge separately. Let's look at the discharging process, as it's a bit simpler to think about. Every small amount of charge, which we'll label dq, moving from one plate to another, goes through a voltage v, which is just the plate voltage at that moment. This results in a small amount of work done equal to v times dq. This statement is true no matter what the capacitor looks like, whether it be parallel plates, spheres, or anything else. We can say that the total energy in our capacitor is simply the sum of all these chunks of work du. We can write this as the integral of du, equal to the integral of the voltage with respect to dq. To find the total energy, we now simply need to evaluate this integral. But how would we integrate the voltage v with respect to charge dq? Well, conveniently, we know the constant capacitance C is equal to Q over V, which we can rearrange to show V equals Q over C. With that, we can rewrite our integral like so, and we now just have to integrate this with respect to dQ. If we want the total energy in our capacitor, we'll integrate from when the charge is equal to zero to when it is equal to our final charge, which we'll label Q final. If we now integrate this, we find that the energy is simply a half times Q squared over C. And if we apply the limits, we get a half Q final squared over C. For neatness, we'll just write Q final as Q. So we can say the energy for any amount of charge in the plates Q is equal to this. This is one of our capacitor energy equations, and the others can be found by simply substituting in our capacitance equation in different ways. If we replace Q with CV, we get U equals a half CV squared. And if we replace C with Q over V, we get a half qv. These equations are all completely equivalent. But why? Why are these the equations for the energy of a capacitor? Well, a much neater way of considering the integral of v with respect to dq is by plotting the graph of the voltage versus the charge in the plates. As we know, this ratio is constant, equal to 1 over c, which is the gradient of this straight line we've drawn. The integral of v with respect to q is just the area under this graph. At any given moment, as we charge or discharge the capacitor, we can see how the energy within the capacitor rises and diminishes. And this matches perfectly to our equations, as 
If we try and calculate this area using basic geometry, it's just the height of a triangle with length q and height v, such that u is just a half times q times v. We can also see how the energy stored in a capacitor varies depending on the capacitance. If we increase the capacitance, the gradient decreases, and if we decrease it, it increases. So, for the same amount of charge in our plates, we can see that the area increases and decreases accordingly. This makes complete sense, as high capacitance means that a lower voltage is required to store the same amount of charge, so the energy required is lower. Meanwhile, a lower capacitance means more voltage and therefore more energy is necessary. So this is how the energy depends on the charge, voltage and capacitance. These equations are very useful, and they're about as deep as most courses on capacitors go. After all, as long as we know two of the three variables, C, Q and V, we can get the energy. But these equations actually miss something very fundamental to the physics. Sure, when charge is moving through a voltage, we know the energy is changing. But once the charge is in the plates, and it stops moving, where does the energy actually go? As we said at the start, we might think it's just stored in the plates as charge, but as we said in the previous part of the series, the charge is predetermined by the capacitance. So the same amount of charge in a different capacitor has a different energy. And capacitance, as we showed, does not fundamentally depend on the voltage or the charge. Instead, it is entirely determined by the geometry of our system and the permittivity of our insulator. Now these quantities are what directly determine the shape and size of the electric field between our plates. And it turns out that when we think about the energy in terms of this, we can attain a much more fundamental way of expressing the energy of our capacitor. So to do this, let's consider our equations for the capacitance and the electric field for a parallel plate capacitor. The capacitance, in terms of the geometry of the system, is simply the insulator permittivity times the plate area over the distance between the plates. The magnitude of the electric field of this system, which is a constant in this case, is simply the voltage between the plates divided by the distance between them. If we consider our half CV squared equation, we can substitute C and V like so, then simplify. So as you can see, the energy can also be expressed as a half times epsilon times E squared times A times D. Now a neater way of writing this is by considering the volume omega between the plates, which is just A times D. So our equation is a half times epsilon times E squared times the volume. What you see here is one of the most fundamental, powerful equations in all of physics. Why? Well, this volume omega is more specifically the volume that our electric field exists in. If we divide through by omega, we find the energy per unit volume to be equal to a half times epsilon times e squared. This equation is the energy density of our field. It tells us how much energy an electric field has at any point in space. So yes, an electric field is energy. Any electric field that exists in nature has an energy density equal to this. As we charge and discharge our capacitor, we are growing and diminishing this electric field between the plates, and it is this field that is the energy. So this is where the energy of our capacitor truly lies. Now you might be a bit sceptical of this, as we just used the equations for a plate capacitor which aren't generalised. But it turns out that this formula applies not only to any capacitor, but any electric field that exists in nature. In a previous video, we showed that the charge in our plates generates a field via Gauss's law, and the voltage is just the line integral of the field from one plate to another. If we write out our equation for the energy, a half times Q times V, and replace Q and V with these definitions, we get a half times epsilon times the surface integral of E with respect to dA, times the line integral of E with respect to dL. We can rewrite these two integrals as the triple integral of E squared with respect to d omega. Specifically, we are integrating E squared over the entire volume it occupies. This is a more general way of writing what we found for our plate capacitor. Now I will admit that this last step isn't actually necessarily true, as dA and dL aren't explicitly defined to reproduce the entire volume of our field. There is actually a more rigorous way of finding this result, which I won't cover here, but if you are curious, there are a few good derivations online, such as this one by Likarev on LibreText.org. 
If anyone is interested in seeing this sort of thing in a video, you can always let me know in the comments section. Either way, going through all that, you'll still get the total energy in an electric field to be a half times epsilon times the volume integral of E squared, no matter what. If you're not convinced, we can easily apply our formula to a parallel plate capacitor again. Here we know that our field is a constant and that it lies entirely between the plates. So we can move the constant E squared outside the integral, leaving only the integral of the volume, which is just the volume between our plates, equal to A times D. So all in all, we get the same result as before. And there you have it. This is the fundamental equation deciding the energy stored in our capacitor. As our plates are charging and discharging, our field is being built and diminished as energy is being transferred to and from our capacitor. This tells us where our energy actually is. Now in practice, as the field is often complex to calculate, we usually just use our basic QVC equations to calculate the energy in capacitors. However, unlike these equations, our latter formula applies to any electric field in nature, and more precisely, any electrostatic system in nature. Any time charges are not on the move, this is the energy of our system. And with that, I hope you now understand more about what the energy of a capacitor really is. But there is still more to say about capacitors. In the last video, we spoke about what really determines capacitance, and in this video we figured out how that relates to energy. But we haven't yet spoken about how long it takes to charge and discharge our capacitor. We also haven't worked out how the current varies during all of this, nor seen how capacitors work in real complex circuits. In the next part of this series, we will explore all these questions by introducing resistor capacitor circuits, or RC circuits for short. By the way, if you enjoyed this video and like testing your physics knowledge, you're welcome to check out the Decipher Physics app, which is completely free and has over 100 questions for you to work through. Thanks for watching.